Section 13.5, collocative properties. Collocative refers to the word like a collection. So it's talking about numbers of solute dissolved particles, not the kinds of particles they are. So any particles that you dissolve into a solution can have effects on certain physical properties. Some of these properties can be your vapor pressure. So let's imagine that you have something very volatile, like gasoline. Remember, volatile means that they are very likely to escape into the atmosphere. So if you were to have a gas can with some gas in it and it's closed, then it's not able to escape into the air, then you are gonna have, at any temperature, lots of these molecules of gasoline that have enough energy to go into the atmosphere. And so you're gonna have gas, uh, gasoline vapor, which is gas gas, that's funny, above the, the liquid gasoline in the can, and eventually has enough that it's pushing down back onto the surface of the liquid, that is vapor pressure. Well, if you dissolve something in that gasoline, you can reduce the vapor pressure and reduce the amount of, of uh, evaporation of the gasoline. There is some stabilizer uh, stuff that you put in your gas. So say you wanna store your lawnmower over the winter and it's in your garage and it's cold in your garage and you're not using your lawnmower at all. Instead of just leaving the gas in the machine where the gas could actually freeze uh, into water and then that would clog up your, your engine, you don't want that to happen, you stabilize the gas and what you're actually doing is reducing the vapor pressure. You're putting some solutes in the gas that's not going to affect the when you burn it in the in the spring it's not going to affect the engine and then but at the same time it's not going to evaporate because you don't want all the gas in your engine to evaporate especially all the water part of the uh, or, or the liquid part gooping up the rest of your engine you don't want that to happen so you stabilize the gas um, there's two other things that are really important boiling point elevation and and uh, freezing point depression. This says de uh, uh, melting point, but it's, it's same as freezing point depression. So if you were to have pure water, let's say it boils at 100 degrees, if you add something to that water that will break apart and either, either be a solute in one part or a solute in more than one part, you can make that water boil at higher temperatures. So just adding salt to your, to your spaghetti water allows that water to be hotter than 100 degrees and your spaghetti cooks faster because that water is no longer 100 degrees, it's maybe 103 or 102 or something like that. And that little bit will increase your spaghetti cooking time. It also salts the spaghetti, so it's a great idea. Another thing is that it lowers the freezing point. If you put salt on the ground, on your sidewalk, then the water that freezes at, at zero degrees Celsius doesn't actually freeze until it gets to, to less than zero, say two or three below zero. Well, that could really affect whether someone slips on the ice or not, and it allows it to melt that ice. So it's, it, keeps, um, it keeps it in liquid form, even though the, the, water's, the air is cold enough to freeze the water. So so vapor pressure lowers when you add a non-volatile um, solute. Boiling point raises up, so it actually boils at hotter than the boiling point, and it freezes lower than the freezing point. The other thing that happens is it deals with osmosis, and osmosis you'll, you'll see mostly when you get to biology, that that's how water comes in and out of cells. So whether or not your cells are receiving um, water and uh, food from your bloodstream or whether a, a water will go into a plant uh, from the soil. All that is dealing with something called osmosis and osmosis is um, dealing with a, with a membrane that we'll look at in a second. First one we're going to look at is vapor pressure. If you add something, if you add a solute to the solvent and this is a solvent that's, say, volatile, that will very easily go into gas phase. If you add a solvent, a solute to it, 
so that solute is somewhat going to stick to the solvent. The solvent is going to be attracted somehow to that solvent. The solvent and the solute are going to have an attraction for each other. And that little bit of a pull that the solute has for the solvent is going to keep some of that solvent from going into the air. So that's why it lowers the vapor pressure. There'll be less molecules of gas above that, above that um, liquid if you add a little bit of solute to it. Okay, so you add some salt or you add some sugar, you add some something to it, you're not gonna have as much um, gas phase um, solvent that as you would have done. The cool thing about this is it's based on how much you add. The more you add, the less vapor will be above that material. So the more stuff you add to, say, your gas, the less gas evaporates. Raoult's law basically gives the comparison or gives the relationship. The, the uh, vapor pressure of, say, A, whatever that is, is based upon the normal vapor pressure with nothing added. That's your P naught sub A, P, P with a little zero sub A. That's the normal pressure. And then the X sub A is the mole fraction of that com uh, of it. So your uh, if it's 90 if it's 90 if your mixture is 90 percent solvent, okay, 10 percent additive. If it's 90 percent solvent, you're only going to get 90 percent of the vapor pressure you would normally have. If you have 80 percent solvent, which means you have 20 percent solute, you're only going to have 80 percent. So the more stuff you add the lower the vapor pressure will be. The next section is boiling point elevation or freezing point depression. If you add a sol solute to a solvent, your solvent will boil at a higher temperature than normal and freeze at a lower temperature than normal. So if you look here at a phase diagram, the black is the normal of that solvent. The blue line is where it is if you add the, the material. So since you're going to get a lowering here, you're going to get a lowering here, that means that it freezes lower. So here's the freezing um, temperature. So here's the freezing temperature normally. Here's the freezing temperature uh, of it with something in it. So it lowers the freezing temperature, okay? It's also going to um, raise the boiling temperature. So when it goes from, if it goes from a liquid to a, um, if it goes li a liquid to a gas, you're going to have more. So here is the lowering of the uh, temperature when you freeze it. Here's the raising of the temperature when you boil it. So since there's a strip there, this distance is the temperature that you have to add to that in order for it to boil. And this temperature is the temperature you have to add to it in order to tell you how, how much it's gonna freeze or where, where it's gonna freeze lower than normal. So to add, say, salt or anything to, uh, to a material, to a, to a solution, it's going to increase the boiling point and decrease the freezing point. We also see that the boiling point um, the boiling point elevation, which is that change in temperature from where it normally is to where it is norm uh, up, is going to be directly related to the molality. And the molality, remember, is the moles of solute uh, divided by kilograms of solvent. So you find its concentration, how concentrated is it in molals, and it's directly related to that. The more molal concentration you have, the higher the boiling point will go up. Okay, so the more stuff you have dissolved in it, uh, so let's say you, you sprinkle a little bit of salt, you'll get a tiny bit of uh, increase in temperature of boiling point. If you add a lot more salt, you're going to increase the temperature even more. The more salt you add, the more the higher it goes. Of course, there's limits to that because the water eventually will uh, be absorbing the salt and it becomes doesn't even flow anymore but you but for a long time it will increase likewise the freezing points the same it's going to be directly related to the molal concentration so here's the molal concentration the freezing point depression 
is going to be directly related to how much stuff is in it. So the more salt that you put in on the, the sidewalk, the colder that it's going to have to be for it to be, to be ice. It will stay liquid longer. So if the molality is the moles of solute divided by the kilograms of solvent, then we see that it doesn't depend on what is dissolved. It's just how many particles we're talking about. If it breaks apart into two particles, you're going to get a double, a double uh, it's going to count almost twice. So putting salt, which will di dis dissociate into sodium and chlorine, will count for twice rather than to put something that doesn't, dis doesn't break apart, doesn't dissociate. So adding something is based upon, like, what do you add will determine whether something goes up once or twice or three times. If you can do a salt that breaks into three times, you get three times the temperature increase based upon your molarity. That's what we see here. Since the properties depend on the number of particles dissolved, the solutions of electrolytes, remember electrolytes are the ones that dissociate into positives and negatives, should show greater changes than those of non-electrolytes. So if you were to put glucose in water, you would get a little bit of an increase. If you were to put salt in water that's going to dissolve into two particles rather than just stay into one, you're going to have twice the increase or twice the decrease in, in freezing point. Of course, nature is very complicated and we see that in the case of, say, salt, something that is high um, electrolytes, strong electrolytes, something that breaks apart into positives and negatives, occasionally those, that, that sodium and chlorine is going to be so close together that it's going to exert a little bit of a pull. And that little bit of a pull for a moment is going to consider that thing to be one particle rather than two. In a split second, it's going to be separated and now it counts into two. So the Van Toff factor explains the fact that if you have something that that's dissociates as a strong electrolyte, completely breaks apart into positives and negatives, it should double. It should be two. You, you should have twice the temperature increase as, something, as one. And it's not quite twice because they exert a force on each other occasionally. And in certain moments, you're going to have one, one something and in other moments you're going to have two. So it's going to be pretty close to two, but not exactly close, not exactly two, because um, reality is reality. The last thing we'll look at is osmosis. And osmosis is a movement of water, usually, between a um, high concentration and a low concentration through a semipermeable membrane. Let's say that I have a membrane that can let little things through but keeps big things through out. Let's say I have a net and little particles are free to move back and forth no problem. Okay, They're going to equalize um, all the time. If I have something, if I have particles bigger on one side than the other, they, can, they have to stay on the left. They're, they can't go through the gates. So this is a semi-permeable membrane. It lets certain small things through, but doesn't let big things through. What will happen is that the water is free to go on both sides, but the big molecules are stuck. Well, what'll happen is on the left side, do I have more pure water on the left or more pure water on the right? Well, in this case, I've got more pure water on the right which means that it's a lot, like a pile of water. There's more pure water. And there is a movement of water from high concentration, that's high concentration, to low concentration of water. Okay, now that makes sense as long as there's nothing else you know, on the side, but you've got these big particles also. So what will really happen is that the water will start piling up on the left side. Whatever you have the concentration of stuff in the water, you're going to have more water go into it because there's more pure water on the right, less pure water on the left, and water will move from high concentration to low concentration of water. And this pileup is going to create an uneven. It's almost like it's almost like water's piling up, and there is a force. Gravity is acting down on this, and normally water will seek a level, but what will happen is that uh, that due to osmosis, okay, 
the smaller water molecules are free to move and the big sugar molecules are not. So what will end up is that you'll end up with a pressure on one side called an osmotic pressure. Quantitatively then, the pressure that, that's called pi, pi for pressure, is going to be equal to the molarity, how concentrated this stuff is on the one side. So remember the big molecules, how concentrated, what's the molarity of that concentration? Times the R, remember that's the ideal ga gas constant, uh, times the temperature. So the pressure is going to be dependent upon temperature and dependent upon sugar, usually sugar concentration on one side. And that's how, uh, that's the pressure that would stop the flow of water. So that how much pressure is required to stop the flow of water? It's this much pressure. It's the pressure which is equal to the molarity times the, and you remember pressure times volume, okay? PV equals NRT. And they've simply taken V, moved it down under N, and, and moles divided by volume is molarity. And so pressure, P, is equal to MRT. That's the pressure required to stop the flow of water across it. And eventually gravity will supply that pressure. So water could go maybe 200 feet up the tree as long as the pipes are very, very small. If you make the pipes bigger, then it won't fl flow very far. In fact, if you have a, a, a high office building or some like a, a skyscraper, you have to have very high pressure in the pipes or else the water doesn't even go all the way to the top. This is pretty cool um, application in red blood cells. If you, were to, if you were to have a blood cell that has stuff dissolved in it and you put it in a solution that's equally concentrated, so the same concentration one way and the other, water will flow out and water will flow in. No big, no big problem. That is called an isotonic, isotonic solution. And that, that uh, cell will be fine. If you were to put um, a cell okay, into one that has lower concentration outside, then you've got more pure water outside, it's going to flow in and it will explode. Okay? This is, this is uh, it will lyse. Lysis is an explosion. Okay? Uh, so a red blood cell, if this is a blood cell, this would be hemolysis where the red blood cells actually explode, they pop, okay? Um, if you put it in the opposite, if you've got whatever this is, and you put it into super high concentration, then the, there's more pure water inside and it'll flow out and you have what's called crenation and it's a shriveling, kind of a raisin, okay? Um, pickles are crenated, okay? They, they are shriveled up and, and kind of wrinkly. It's the same idea. So if you were to put a IV solution in your arm, it has to be isotonic to your body cells. Otherwise, your body cells will either shrivel up or explode, and then death would ensue very dramatically afterwards.